for the name of our service, Jesus, open our eyes, open our hearts, open our ears for what you have for us. Thank you for who you are and who you say we are. We say all this in your name. Amen. Let me, uh, let me add a little good morning to you this morning. Um, hey, normally if you're here on a regular basis, I kind of float around a lot on the stage. Uh, I'm going to do it a little bit different today because partly uh, because the tone, the heaviness of what I want to share with us, particularly as we get to the end, might feel better if we were like having coffee together or maybe a lunch or whatever. And so if that particularly would resonate with you, you can just imagine sitting up here right with me and we'll, we'll go with that. We are in a series that we have developed from a phrase out of First Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32, and it is this listing of all these men who were following after David before he was the king and then when he became king and after the king. And, and uh, from the tribe of Issachar, it says, and the men of Issachar, from the sons of Issachar, men who understood the times and knew what Israel should do. The reason why they knew what Israel should do is because they understood God's directives and they understood the times that they lived in. So what we've been trying to navigate is... Look, if we understand our times, it helps us to take the truths in this book that times have no relevance to, right? God's truth is God's truth does not change. But the times we live in helps us to figure out how to apply God's truth to the times that we're in. And then today what we're going to do is we're going to look at the times that we're in have attached to them a way that we make decisions, particularly on, hey, what's right, what's wrong? And we're gonna take a look because there's a gravitational pull that you and I feel because we live in the times that we are in, that we too would make decisions in the same manner. And it's, I would compare it to, if you ever go to the beach and you sit in an inner tube 150 yards out in the ocean and you just kind of relax for a little bit, you close your eyes and a couple minutes later you open your eyes, you look at the beach and you have no idea, you don't recognize anything because there's this pull that gets us to drift and, and perhaps this morning uh, there's some drifting that we need to maybe stop doing. All right, last week I wanna encourage you if you did not were not here or did not listen to last week's message that Caleb shared about what do you do when people disagree with you? I wanna encourage you to go back and, and, and listen. One of the heartbeats that we have, I think God calls us to make points, but it's not enough to make points. What God calls us to do is to make points that make differences. And if the manner in which I make a point is counterproductive, then making a point's not enough, all right? Today, I want us to, to dive into, we're gonna tackle this question of what's the right thing to do? You instinctively ask this question. Follow Jesus, don't follow Jesus. You still have to answer some questions of what's the right thing to do. Uh, sometimes those are political issues, whether that's abortion, immigration, tariffs, national security, defense, what's the right thing to do? And you run through this cycle of how do I determine what's the right thing to do? You also do this in a personal way. You do it more often than you do in a political way. I mean, every two years or so, we run through election cycles, the political aspects become bigger, but every day the personal issues are there. What's the right thing to do? Hey, what's the right thing to do for me in regard to lifestyle choices? In, in regards to, hey, what do I do with the resources that God has given me financially? What do I do with the time resources? How do I spend my time? What do I do, I like spiritual questions. When God, I feel like God might be calling me to do something. What's the right, what's the right thing to do? All right, let me start out 
and you're going to hate me for this, with some very bad news <laughs> on us figuring out what the right thing to do is. All right. So there are... Um, there is a verse in the book of Proverbs that's repeated word for word twice. Proverbs 14, 12, Proverbs 16, 25. And it says, like, it says it like this. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. All right, the way, there's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Now the solution to that is not, well then just ask a woman, right? <laughs> This is mankind, right? Men and women. There's a, way, there's a way that seems right to men and women, and its end is the way of death. The, the solution to this is also not, well, that's singular. Yeah, so just get a bunch of people together, and they'll figure out the right thing to do. Look, if we could, here's what this verse is telling me. If we could collectively gather just a, a host of just good-intentioned, wise people and let them figure out what's the right thing to do, the end of that is frequently, more frequent than we would dare to admit, frequently not good. There's a way that seems right, right? It doesn't seem wrong. Hey, we're gonna do what seems right, and the end is the, the way of death. Why is that? What, like, like, what's wrong with doing what seems right? All right, so let me... Let me answer that by going to another proverb, Proverbs 4, 23. Guard your heart with all diligence, for from it flows all the issues of life. Now, we tend to think that heart in that situation is talking about our emotions. Hey, guard your emotions. Don't let them run wild because it'll steer you in that bad direction. The heart, biblically speaking, is not simply our emotions. The heart is the control center of our decisions. That has to do with, yes, that has to do with emotions. It has to do with, hey, what do I yearn for, all right? Because it, part of it is, hey, look, if you want something, you're going to figure out a way to get it and make it right. But the heart really has to do with, it has to do with our mind and the way that we think. Because that is the, you, you've heard this statement and you may have used this statement before. Hey, why did you do this? I just kind of followed my heart. You weren't just talking about your emotions. You were talking about your whole decision. I just did what seems right. And what seems right often is not, all right? We need to do something more than that. Let me give you a word that describes a philosophy of decision-making a philosophy of ethics, right and wrong, that has been around for quite a while, but it has ramped up, and it is this word consequentialism. All right? Consequentialism, as the root of it, consequences, says, hey, we can determine what is morally right or wrong based on the consequences that come to us on those actions. An action is right if the, if the consequences to it are good. All right? And we do this in non-moral issues all the time. So, for example, why is it that we don't just have some blanket uh, speed limit everywhere? All right? Like 70, I mean, personally, I'd go like 80. All right? I, I'd ramp, I'd be all in favor. Hey, an 80-mile-an-hour speed limit any, everywhere. That, we wouldn't do that. You know why? Because of the consequences. Because sometimes when you round, round a curve, don't go 80. Sometimes when you're in a, in a neighborhood, please don't go 80. Right? The consequences get us... All right, and that, that, that works, all right? Or school schedule. You are aware that the school schedule that we presently are in was determined a long time ago because of the agricultural communities where most people lived, which is why we have summer vacation, all right? Now, that, that's consequentialism. I do it, do what's right based on what the consequences are. Or... You know, the, the fact that you, you'll, you'll drive on a highway and, and you'll stop and you'll pull up to this little booth, which is kind of weird, and there's this basket in front of the booth, and you throw these coins in so that this flag goes, or this bar goes up, and you can drive through. Toll booths, why do we do that? Because of the consequences, because we raise, raise a lot of money, do careful roads, etc. Okay, consequentialism is fine in non-moral issues, but when it comes to morality, I mean, true things that are, hey, it's right, and it's wrong, there are massive gaps in consequentialism, even though we still use it there, all right? It's what makes 
Proverbs 14, 12, and 16, 25 so relevant. There is a way that seems right, seems right. We do it because we think it's best, but in its end, it leads to death, all right? Um, You are aware that Adolf Hitler had moral justification in his own mind for what he did in the Holocaust. You know why? Because it worked. All right, so how do we fight that? And here's what it is. As a follower of Jesus, I am one. Many of you are as well. As followers of Jesus, our right and wrong is not determined by what works. Our right and wrong is determined by what aligns with the heart and the way of Jesus. As a follower of Jesus, what's morally right or wrong for me is not what works. I'll I'll, I'll use what works, that uh, that becomes right or wrong. It's what aligns myself with the way of Jesus. Now, many of you, you're bristling a little bit because you're like, yeah, but the way of Jesus does work. You are correct. But it, it, it's not right because it's work, because it works. It works because it's right. Two very different things. The way of Jesus is not right because it works. It's right because it's true. Right? So what do you wanna do real quick? I, I, wanna, I wanna give you some reasons why we can't determine moral rightness and wrongness based on what works for me or what works for you. All right, I'll give you three reasons real quick. One. What, what works for me, what works for us, is inherently self-centered, which, by the way, is not the gospel of Jesus. Self-centeredness is not the gospel of Jesus. If you think Jesus is, is about what works, check this out. John 16, 24, Jesus' words. If anyone would come after me, let him deny myself and take up the cross and follow me. You know what that does not do? Work. That doesn't work for you. What's the cross? What's that? Take up your cross? What is that? Ah, it's a metaphor for, that Jesus used to talk about how this is going to be difficult. It's an execution tool. Following Jesus in his own words does not work, but it's true. All right? He said things like, hey, lay down your lives. Doesn't work for you. He said things like sacrifice all, doesn't work for you. He said things like turn the other cheek, doesn't work for you. Walk the extra mile, doesn't work for you. The morality of Jesus is not the morality because it works, it works because it's right. And sometimes for it to work, it takes a long time for that to come about. Look, in the long term, what Jesus describes for us as his way, it does work in the long term, but often it doesn't feel like it. Gospel is not right because it works for us. It's right because it's true. All right, second, what works for us, consequentialism, what's best for us will at times be worse for others, right? Hey, what what works for us, sometimes it's just not gonna work for other people. I can honestly tell you that I've never prayed for, nor if you ask me, by the way, will I pray for you? If you ask me to, I've made, never prayed for the victory of my children's athletic teams. You know why? Partly because I'm not sure God cares. Secondly, because there's a lot of Jesus-loving people who are parents of, of kids on the other team that are, like for, for my kids to win a game, which means somebody else's kids are not. And if you tell me, hey, listen, our team won whatever it is, God showed his favor on them, I'm going to be like, did he? So God didn't like them as so much, right? Listen, for, for, for me to, right, what's best for me will at times not be, it'll be worse for other people. Here's a, here's a political issue. Out of control budget spending, right, deficit, out of control budget deficit, feels like it's good for us. Look, it'll boost economy, it'll do this, it'll do that, we'll do this, we'll give these handouts, blah, 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 blah. You know what that, it's, it feels best for us. You know who it's not best for? I mean, you know. Your grandchildren. 
And my grandchildren, what's best for us will at times be worse for other people. And that is going to apply big in an issue that we're going to talk about. And the third reason why consequentialism is just not good is that we're not wise enough to determine what always, what's always best for us. You're just not smart enough. I'm not, it's not an insult to you. I'm not insulting your intelligence. I'm not wise enough to always know what's best for me. The book of Judges in the Old Testament gives this, it's a condensed history of a long period of time in the history of Israel where they had these cycles, all right? So the cycle looked like God was blessing his people and they were loving God and then they kind of forgot where their blessing came from and, and then God, uh, they were rebellious and disobedient so God brought some consequences and they went through some hard times and then they finally wised up and said, oh God, please, we're so sorry, we'll follow you, we promise. And then God would send a deliverer which was called a judge who would bring them back and then they these cycles and cycles and cycles and cycles and the summary, you don't have to read the whole book of Judges. I can give you the summary of it. Judges chapter 21, verse 25. It's at the end of the book, and here's what it says. In, the, in those days, there was no king in Israel. All right? Now, that is talking about a physical human king, but the real problem was there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Not what was wrong, not what was selfish, they did what was right in their own eyes. They just weren't, weren't wise enough to figure out what was truly right. So consequentialism, right? Determining right and wrong by what, 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 is it, what does it do versus right and wrong determined by the way of Jesus. I want to bring up two sensitive issues, political issues, but they're also personal issues. Two sensitive issues to show you that hey, just doing what you think works best for you or a group of people around you that are probably like you is not always the way of Jesus. So let's talk the border and immigration, all right? Uh, unbeknownst to, I knew, I knew weeks ago, we're gonna address these two issues today. Uh, our youngest daughter in the last week in, in the Yoder clan group text, throughout this question. It's due to a, a graduate class that she's taking, and she said, hey, what do you all think about the border and immigration? And so everybody's kind of firing in their responses and stuff, and, and we, we, we listen to Caleb's words, you know, if, if we disagree, we're not gonna rant, we're not gonna, right, we're gonna do, we're gonna fight the right way, we're gonna, we're gonna be curious about what each other thinks, and so we walk through all of that, all right? Um, Consequentialism says the right and wrongness at the border and immigration should be weighed by what's best for us. Can I just say this? You know this. What's best for some of us is not what's best for others of us. And what you and I are called to do, if you are a follower of Jesus, is I gotta glean and learn what is the heart of the Lord what is the heart of Jesus and where does his way direct us? So where do I find that in scripture? If you look in scripture um, for groups of people who are foreigners, outsiders, sojourners, uh, asylum seekers, refugees, Migrants, migrants would be people who leave a country to go to another place to flee poverty. All right, God, one, he gives us commands to care for those people. But if you just did a deep dive real quick and just scanned the sur and surveyed the lists of people who fit those categories out of the Old Testament, let me give you some of their names. The 12 tribes of Israel left Israel to go to Egypt. They were migrants. They left because they were impoverished. They had no food. I think of Ruth. We did a whole series, series on Ruth. Ruth was a, a, an, an outsider. She was a foreigner who rode the coattails of her mother-in-law back to Israel. And the gospel that is told through her story is powerful. I think Ruth had a, a, a grandson whose name was David, King David. 
You know King David was a refugee? Because when King Saul was hunting him, you know what David did? He ran and he hid and he fled. And at some point he went to live in the cities of the, Fa- the Philistines, the enemy territory. And they provided help for him. I think of, um, of Daniel, Daniel in the lion's den. You know where the lion's den was? It wasn't in Israel. He was a refugee in another place. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, refugees. Let me give you three more who were refugees who fled for political asylum because they were being hunted down. Joseph, Mary, and Jesus. Listen, your spiritual heritage is immigrants, migrants, refugees, asylum seekers. And God chose it that way. And God commands us as people, have compassion and care for. So let me just tell you what I think that means when it comes to the issues of the border. I think we should have a secure border. Oh, Mark, Mark where, is, where do you find that? And I'm just looking at just the kind of the way of God. Look, they locked their doors. You know what there was around Jerusalem? A wall, right? God didn't tear, say tear it, right? There was a wall around Jerusalem, but it was just kind of an appropriate defense mechanism. Look, we lock our doors every night here, okay? You come here, try to get out at mid- in at midnight, good luck. You're not gonna be able to get in. We lock our doors, but it's not like we're gonna build a razor wire fence around our property, right? There's an appropriate defense to be secure. With that, I also believe in the deep, deep compassion and care for people that are disadvantaged. And by the way, that's not a government responsibility. You know who that falls on? Our shoulders. It falls on Jesus followers we should care for, people that need to come in, that need help, etc. I personally believe what we need to do is we need to expand the bandwidth of legal immigration. Now, you would say to me, Mark, that's complicated. I get it. It is complicated. Well, who, which side should I vote for? Well, we figure it out, right? If you want to know, we told you early in this, we're not going to tell you how to vote. If you want to know how I'm going to vote, take me to lunch. And it better be good, right? Okay? So, let me... Let me I realize there's complications. Just figure out a way to align align your policy with the way of Jesus. So let's jump from immigration to abortion. If you've been here, you know I'm not a big manuscriptor, meaning I don't type out word-for-word messages, in essence, read it for you. I go off notes. All of our people who share messages on a Sunday morning pretty much do the same thing. I did this different. So I, I typed out, here's what I want to say about abortion. And I sent it to all of our elders and a host of other people that I really respect their discernment and said, tell me what you think, tone, truthfulness, sensitivity. And I got a bunch of response back and that's what I have. And I'm not going to read this for you, but I will closely walk along. Here's what I think about the abortion issue. As I think, it calls us to align ourselves with the heart and the way of Jesus. Um, look, uh, abortion has implications for voting, check boxing, right? Box checking. But it also has a lot of implications for personal choices and lifestyles. Look, we, we recognize that on any Sunday morning, we have hosts of people that these two issues feel very personal to. All right, we have hosts of people who are, who are immigrants. We have hosts of people who are in, 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 the, in the United States that have not walked through the immigration process. And the heart of Jesus is for all. all right? Now, we also have hosts of people on any given Sunday as we gather here together whose life histories have a chapter that could be labeled the termination of a pregnancy. And to those of us men and women who that is true for, I would say our response as a church, my response as a person, forget the, far, the, the, fact, that I, the fact that I'm a, um, I'm a pastor, my response as a person would be, I just want you to hear the loudest words possible, the gospel of Jesus. That God loves broken people, which we all are. And that God sent Jesus to buy back our past. 
and that God sent Jesus to live in a way that shows us here's how he commands us to move forward. That's what I would say to, to all of us, but particularly to those who that is part of your past. So what do I do? As I pursue aligning myself with the way of Jesus, what, how does that speak to this issue? I've mentioned this in the past, and I personally believe that the, that the breakdown of the abortion issue into life versus choice is tragically oversimplistic. I don't know many people that sit on the life side that say, yeah, let's take all the choice away. I don't know many people that sit on the choice side that say, yeah, we're anti-life, right? But I also understand that when it gets to, there's points that it feels like those two conflict with each other, let's address that. All right, what do we, what do, we do? Um, what aligns my heart with the way of Jesus? Um, uh, consequentialism has some major problems with this. Because consequentialism says, hey, let's make what's right whatever it is that is, does the best good. And let's make what's wrong whatever it is that harms. The problem with that is, is that in this issue, if I'm going to answer the question, hey, well, listen, it's best to do this, I would ask, best for who? Right? Best for who? What aligns with the way of Jesus and what do we direct us to do? The way of the Lord in the Old Testament and the way of specific way of Jesus in the New frequently calls God's people to be the voice for those who don't have a voice or whose voice is very, very uh, limited. Uh, the underdog, the scared, the intimidated, the vulnerable, God, be a voice for those people. For example, God's people should have a deep care and concern for the widow and the orphan, and we've got to do better at that. Um, As well as for the hurting pregnant woman, and especially here for the unborn child. So, in simple words, here's where I think the way of Jesus speaks to this issue. Yes, I am for women's reproductive rights up to a point. And to clarify, that point is when a woman becomes pregnant. All right? Um, At that point, there are still choices that are available for a woman, but the choice to end a pregnancy is no longer on the table. Consequentialism is the rule of the day for many in the pro-choice movement. All right, which is, let's do what's best for this group of people. To which I would say, where's the consequentialism for the unborn child? Who's speaking on behalf? All right? Now, Scripture speaks loudly. All right? um, and and in, in a very, like, uh, if you, I, I Children's, those, the, un, the unborn children's voices are so loud even though they're so quiet. Right? Um, I say yes to women's rights, but I say a louder yes. Please hear me with compassion. I say a louder yes to the rights of unborn children. Um, show me from Scripture where I'm wrong, and I will gladly sit down and listen to your argument. Just show me from Scripture where I'm wrong. Scripture speaks clearly as to the Lord forming us in the womb, Psalm 139. You didn't just form in the womb. God formed you in the womb, in the womb, pre-birth. He knows my days. I am fearfully, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Um, Even the pro-choice community no longer argues when life begins. Right, that is a moot point because the, you can't because the scientific community argues that life begins at conception or like immediately thereafter. That that argument has disappeared. The argument from the pro-life, pro-choice community has now become, and this is so dangerous, has become the issue of personhood. See, because for 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 consequences to not be dire for an abortion, I gotta make what happens not that big of an issue. So it's, it's, well, they're not a person yet. They don't think clearly. They don't understand their own identity. 
that's a dangerously slippery slope for end of life things as well. All right. Quality. All right. Scripture speaks to the value of all of life. All of life. And then the debate of the issue that we have found ourselves often pitting women against children. Tragically so. It is not either or, it is both and. Um, love of Jesus is not selective. Jesus loves passionately and deeply every woman who finds herself pregnant when she would rather not be. Passionately, deeply. But his way is right for all. And the people of Jesus, when walking his way, love her as well. All right. um, sometimes to go through a pregnancy, every time to go through a pregnancy is, is difficult. Sometimes the difficulty is just almost feels overbearing. I talked to a young woman after the first service who walked through it and for three days wanted to go to a clinic and her parents wouldn't let her. And she looked at me with eyes, she was like, I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful. Um, See, so I can't help but think that the words of Proverbs 14, 12, and 12, and 16, 25, they always ring true. I just feel like there's a special ring of truth in this issue. There is a way that seems right to mankind, but in the way, in the end, it's the way of death. And I know that there are some of us that jump quick, we jump quickly to the exceptions. Your heart bends you that way, Right? It's like because you have this heart of compassion. By the way, your heart of compassion is a fraction of what God's is. Mine as well. And I get it. Right? I understand the whole, uh, the whole exceptions thing. Uh, USA Today in 2019 uh, found that 1%, they just did a lot of research on it, and these even other organizations, the, the, the percentages are very, very similar. 1% of adoptions are had because of rape. 0.5% because of incest. Roughly 2% are... Um, are due to the complications of health to the mother. And we quickly jump to the 3.5%. I get it. Like, I understand. What does the way of Jesus say? So Jesus, the king of compassion, who's Lord of the mountaintops, when everything's great and it's amazing and we're so excited, and he is Lord of the valleys, when it is the deepest, darkest, He's a savior who came to redeem, to buy back, and to walk with us through the muck of life. Where does he guide us? In walking through very hard times. And if you've read the New Testament, and I suspect a lot of you have, you recognize that he is the champion of hard times. And he promises you not one day without hard times. What does Jesus guide us in? Look, I know it's hard. I know it's challenging. Um, way of Jesus should shape us. Sh should shape us in what box we check between now and next Tuesday. But it also should shape us in some, some personal decisions. And I, I, I want to just, like, I don't know how this stirs you. Um, for some of us, it stirs up, steers up some guidance and some shaping in how we ought to think. For some of us, it'll stir up some questions. We'd love to, I'd love to field those, all right? You have some questions. Hey, Mark, but what about? Shoot me an email. Set up a time. We can come talk. If you're going to shoot me an email, give me a little bit of time. There might be a thousand that I have to respond to. All right? But you, you have, we, I'd love to, to, to address that. But some of us, what this stirs up is guilt. So let me speak with compassion to that. You know, I think of the man who shaped post-Jesus, the New Testament church, more than any other individual, was a murderer. And I'm not calling, you know, listen, listen. The, for those of us who have a past, that termination of, an, of a pregnancy is a part of it. If God can take Paul and use him hugely for his kingdom, your history is a blank. And I just... Was I, I serve a Savior who takes broken people who are all of us, and he makes amazing things happen. And if that would be helpful for you to deal with your past, we would love to walk with you through that.
I've got some people in the Let's Talk room, and I will direct you to that after the service head out, hang a left, and have the courage to say, can I talk? And we'll take care of that as well. All right, let me pray for us. Jesus, thank you. Um, you don't shy away from difficult, difficult decisions. I thank you that in the midst of uh, our people here today, um, this stirs us. It's heavy. God, would you, Jesus, I don't want to make right, wrong decisions just on what my wisdom says is best for people. Help me align myself with your way. In the end, it really is best for people. Your way. I thank you for your goodness. I thank you, God, that your word does not change. Regardless of our times, help us to understand the times we live in and that we would make decisions